Nice. Right, well, I'm just gonna start recording now. Oh god. Have you ever smoked Alejandro? Of course he has. Really? Of course I smoked. He's fucking here. Oh nice. So the streets maybe after this recording or tomorrow. Tomorrow after eating. Oh no, you're not you're not eating. You should join the first like few minutes. The podcast has already started. As a special guest. Today we have a special guest here, yeah, Alejandro from yeah, the first already started. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's that's get, we can do it. Let's get a beer. Close the door before he leaves. Yeah. <laughs> do you, okay, so do you have some cups here? Like maybe three? I have one there and I have a mug. Okay, so I, I, can, I can join for about like... Yeah, that's good. That's true. Five seconds. Yeah. Okay. So can I have the cup? Yeah, of course. Maybe we should steal one of the cups from the kitchen too. <gasps> oh, it is recorded? Yeah, it's So started. anything I say is a proof right now? Yeah, although I'm gonna close the door. Yeah. So we use this one cup and share it. And then there's a shit in it. <laughs> so oh. Oh, shit. oh yeah, sorry. I had to tea. So what do you want to tell the world about how shit physics is? <laughs> yeah, let's start <laughs> with the physics. Yeah, let's start with that. And the uh, theory of everything. <laughs> the theory yeah, of everything. the answer to the universe. <laughs> yeah, is it possible? <laughs> is that the bullshit every physicist say in a hundred years? We can do it and they cannot do anything about it? I don't know, man. I think most physicists right now are living in a fantasy, really. Like how? With string theory and, and all that. I mean, I heard about the string theory, but... Oh, wait, rem I remember you explained to me this one thing about how this one concept is, like, proven, like, mathematically. It was something you explained to me, like, a super long time ago. I don't remember if it was string theory. Do you remember that? It was, like, in the lounge on the fourth floor. Yeah, it was relativity. Yeah. Not relativity, yeah. But can you want to get blown away, let him explain. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I have some concept about relativity and like, quantum physics, something like that, but I don't know what a string theory is in the first place. Like, can you explain a little bit? Like, just the basic concepts, not something fancy. So... I know, it's hard. <laughs> <laughs> no yeah, pressure, man, no pressure. No, because we don't have background probably in physics, so it's hard. Yeah. We, no, but he explained it to me once though, and I understood it, but I forgot. <laughs> no, but that was general relativity. Yeah, we'll go ahead with that. Yeah, it's Maybe a different shit. About this. Yeah, so, so I know, so we studied this about relativity, and it said, if you have, if you have two, two persons in space-time, and one person is accelerating, a constant acceleration, mm. they're both moving in space and time. Mm. And there is something called the event horizon. Mm, yeah, I heard about it. So the guy who's not accelerating, there will be a point in which it will cross the event horizon of the one who's accelerating. Mm. Yeah, and, and the reason is that because the gravity is so strong there, the photon and the light cannot escape this, uh, what is it, event of horizon. So it goes back to this. But that's for black holes. Oh, black holes, yeah, exactly. So, this is what happens if you if you attach so anything that crosses the event horizon of someone who's accelerating and the person who is accelerating won't be able to to see what's beyond the event horizon mm -hmm. so this is what happens if you attach a string to the two observers and you let them move in space and in time there's a paradox like you can think the moment in which one observer across the event horizon mm -hmm. of the one who's accelerating you'll think that the that observer will disappear mm -hmm. yeah i see but that doesn't happen what happens is that for the ones who is accelerating mm -hmm. the observer will never reach his event horizon i i mean I read something similar to like from the black hole when a person in want to enter the what is a black hole and it, it is what kind of touching the event horizon 
he enters the event horizon and he never what is it exit uh, from the black hole but from the observer he sees the person enter the event horizon stationary forever but uh, you have a what is it called constant picture of the person you can see it forever in the event horizon the minute he yeah. enters the black hole yeah to you the person is there forever but he already passed it mm -hmm. because the light cannot escape and the light forever stays there and the thing is that in the physics the light is information and some philosopher says that everything is information that like kind of information there is no matter and there is no energy okay. there is a space-time and there is information through the space-time so and you perceive it as energy you perceive it as a mass but as a whole it's just information in the world so it yeah. and the way you perceive the information change your mindset like this event horizon the information is there consistently you see so i don't know how it helped your <laughs> point in any way i think, I think it's yeah it's, it's very related because for the guy who's accelerating the other person will take um an infinite amount of time to reach the event horizon mm -hmm. so we'll stay there kind of oh forever so, yeah forever and so, uh, like about this, what is it called? Parallel worlds. You said it's not parallel worlds, it's like other dimension that you don't have access to it, yeah? So there are things like, for example, so this is, this is what I kind of remember. And it's that, yeah, there, there are more dimensions and for some reason, this dimension, or, in this dimension or something like that, gravity is super weak. So all the forces that exist, the, the strong force, the weak force, there's the electromagnetic force, and then the gravity, well, the first three, they're super noticeable, like they're strong. Yeah. But then gravity is weak. Yeah, because it works in the long distance, not in the short distance. So something like that. I mm -hmm. think it, it has to do with, with um, like they're kind of, I don't know, like yeah. circles or vortices. Mm -hmm. So it's like it's like a circle. I don't know something like that. Like the dimension in which gravity works better, mm -hmm. like a circle. I don't understand the concept of that. But, mm -hmm. uh, but I saw like the parallel was come from the quantum physics. Like a matter can be at two places or not two places, like more places uh, than one places at a certain time. So if a matter can be in different places in a certain time, there are different. What is it called? options for realities that dif different realities can exist at the same time something like that yeah as long as I can remember did you read something about the different interpretations of quantum mechanics um, so no but maybe I have some idea but I didn't read the exact book or something like that okay so there's one interpretation that's called the, I think the multi-universe or multi-world mm. interpretation I think that's mm. what you're kind of saying and there's another one that's a Copenhagen interpretation. Um, and what's that? That's the one that physics believes the most, I think. And it's that before you measure the position of a particle, the particle wasn't anywhere. Mm -hmm. Oh, I remember. Yeah, I remember mm -hmm. this. Yeah. Yeah, that that shit tripped me up big time. You explain that to me. Uh -huh. I remember something like anything that you haven't seen yet doesn't exist. Yeah, yeah it could be. Yeah, and but I don't really remember the rationale behind it, but I remember it made sense. It's like, Sh I think Schrodinger paradox is some kind of related to this. You know? Schrodinger's cat. And Schrodinger's cat. <laughs> so it says that there is a cat in the, what is it called, box, and there is a radioactive uh, mater material in the box. So you cannot be sure if the cat is alive or not. It can be in either position, but either uh, situation, whether dead or not. Mm -hmm. And there's a, I don't know, bait quantum and he explains it with the quantum physics concept he says that unless you open the box it is uncertain because it's your observation that yeah. determines the actual happening of the, the event yeah. mm -hmm. and in the quantum physics uh, there's another German where uh, what is a physicist um, has an uncertainty Heisenberg. Uh, Heisenberg. Uh, Heisenberg uncertainty theory so he says that when you want to it's impossible to 
measure the speed of the particle and the location of the particle at the same time yeah. because the minute you want to measure the speed you should send a photon to this particle when the, the photon touches uh, the particle and it comes back and the photon changes the what is it called nature of this particle and change the speed so you can know the uh, position of the particle but the minute you want to measure it the speed change yeah. so it's impossible f for anyone to want to say at this time the position is this and the speed is this so it always changes and changes and the funny thing about this Heisenberg is that I saw it in a uh, kind of documentary from the I don't know which TV show was genius it was about the Einstein but part of it was this Heisenberg so they recruited it this Heisenberg in the project and to, told him you should develop us for this nuclear bomb and he was considered the most intelligent guy in the Germany by that time even far 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 better than Einstein but by then probably Einstein already left to yeah, uh, yeah Einstein was in US already yeah but they kind of because of this, this Jewish uh, problem something like that. yeah they hired this guy and the five years he couldn't make the bomb like in failed every time like I don't know 10 to 20 experiment everything when the war uh, was concluded and the German lost the war and it was announced in the radio that the, what is it Yankees like the US has the atomic bomb and Yankees. Right, yeah. it, it, it is the word that they really use in this TV show okay. like his college comment yeah these Yankees could uh, develop this atomic bomb and you're genius and you couldn't do it and he said okay give me a piece of paper and he wrote the way they could Developed atomic bomb. So on purpose, he did yeah, he, on yeah, purpose yeah, he I, failed every experiment yeah, because he, he thought it's not a good thing. Like he probably that. didn't want any responsibility. I know, yeah, like exactly. Einstein, when the like bomb was first used, he kind of felt guilty because he's like, oh, like some of the theories they use is stuff I came up with, so he yeah, felt exactly. like shit. Because the f they didn't know that there's one thing Einstein did. He didn't develop the atomic bomb, but he informed the president of the US that there's something going on in Germany and there is a nuclear bomb they're developing. He just wrote a letter to the president of the US, I think Roosevelt was probably, yeah. yeah. Then they started developing the bomb, then Einstein get guilty, felt guilty about it. By end of the war, he wrote another letter to the president, but the president was dead mm. by then. So the, pre the new president come and he didn't probably give a shit about this letter. And they develop it anyway. Damn, that's crazy. How was he able, able to keep that secret though the entire time? The Heisenberg? Heisenberg? Yeah. Mm. That's insane. Oh, because surely, that was, like, the yeah. Nazis and shit, like, fucking. But like, he was strict, I think, probably super time. genius and he was above all the sign. Yeah. Actually, in this movie, there was a, what is it called? A US intelligence officer went to this class of this Heisenberg. He wanted to murder Heisenberg for three times. They couldn't <laughs> do it. And after three times, they believe that this Heisenberg doesn't know a clue about atomic bomb because he convinced everyone he doesn't know shit about the yeah, atomic bomb. He was smart enough to convince people he didn't know it. Yeah, he's, exactly. That means intelligence. Yeah. yeah, but I'm really not jealous, but it's really interesting time during like 60, 70 years ago in Germany. Every famous physicist was in Germany. Every famous psychologist was in Germany. Like engineer, all of them was in Germany. Philosophers, yeah, philosopher like before the 1800s, right? Yeah, everyone was in Germany. Like, I don't know what it was a cultural thing, they were genius in the first place, but I don't know, it was I don't know. Well, Yeah, you German. can see one German right now, <laughs> so deep, so many layers. <laughs> Jesus Christ, <laughs> cheers! Yeah, um, in your degree, have you come across a lot of like history of physics? in class or is it usually just like theoretical stuff not really just mathematics okay but do you ever learn like oh so now we're going to cover this concept which was invented by this guy and you're or this girl and yeah. you're given a bit of context but yeah. it doesn't go more than that yeah it doesn't go oh, too okay. much in there do you example, wish you did more i'm pretty sure you know more terms but for example when you mentioned you know, the heisenberg's uncertainty, uncertainty mm -hmm. principle i know how to how to show it mathematically? Mm. It doesn't know what it's called. <laughs> yeah. but, but it doesn't. Yeah, like, I cannot go too much into the philosophy of it. Let's see. Yeah, I know, because uh, there are two ways you can, what is it called, approach these scientific questions, or anything like 
they said there are three different worlds the world of reality the world of logic and the world of fantasy so the world of fantasy is something that has a really really less chance to happen in reality the world of logic can actually happen in reality but it, it may not so there is no certainty that the way you think mathematically it happened in the real world and there is a real world that any shit can happen yeah. so about this general relativity actually Einstein can be the first notion like the specific r- relativ- relativity the special relativity uh, special relativ- I thought it was Poin- Poincaré on the that's mathematician professor says on mathematician yeah. yeah so Einstein was in competition with this mathematician so mathematician didn't have any idea any shit about this physics thing about the relativity but with the mathematics he could beat Einstein improving the theory and there for one year they were in competition like you know a person should come with the first with the idea and pro- this mathematician came first actually with the idea but he made a small mistake <laughs> then the Einstein get advantage of the mistake and he said okay this was a mistake so I I have a better solution so either you can have a philosophy not philosophical idea more uh, pragmatic idea or you can just go abstract tackle the question it's really interesting you can have absolutely no clue and just follow the logic reach a certain point and there is no what is it, argument about it you know a professor told us once if you have a, an idea in physics don't share it with your mm-hmm. mathematician friends because <laughs> they'll be able to solve the problem and yeah faster than you <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's what's happening the rivalry yeah but do you guys study in Germany about this kind of thing? I don't know. About I never the... went to school in Germany, so I don't know. Oh, so you, oh, you didn't study? <laughs> no. But for me, a person studying in Germany should be really interesting. They talk about the philosophers, they talk about the history, they talk about, I don't know. Yeah. There are a lot of things to cover, like in the past 200 years. Like for us in Iran, we covered something like really important for 2000 years ago because like that time it yeah. was really prominent and everything. But the past 200 and 300 years ago, there is nothing to cover in the history. Look, it was like a lame. <laughs> Everyone sucked. We had oil, we had fire. There was poor people, everyone was dying. <laughs> there is no light in it. Oh my god. Yeah, it is interesting though to think that like Germany did have a lot of like uh, prominent figures, especially at the dawn of the 20th century. I remember I did a, a course on the history of science and we basically covered like how knowledge passed throughout nations and like empires throughout the world. Mm-hmm. So like the Persian Empire for a while they had a lot of knowledge. They took it from the Greeks kind mm-hmm. of thing. And then the Romans came and they conquered and they took all the knowledge. And then slowly after the Enlightenment and the Renaissance it came back to Europe. But the main countries at the time you had it were like France, Italy. Mm-hmm air to Germany wasn't a country back then and like England too and like you know these important places but I really don't know why like Germany around the like late 19th early 20th Mm -hmm. century just like had all these important things I do know uh, one thing that was important at the time was that governments subsidied these like uh, research programs Mm -hmm. so once once governments realized that sign the scientific enterprise it's was power. the way forward and its pat was just mm-hmm. power, not like religion, mm-hmm. they started to like uh, finance all these things. Yeah, because there is a circle like finance. You go to research, research come to power, power gets the money. Then money again gets and so it's yeah. cool. But that, that did take a while for governments to recognize that. But I don't know why Germany like. Probably they have a lot of prominence. What is it called? Research and scientists they help each other. Yeah, maybe. Have, one of the examples is not like in your fucking physics degree, yeah right? <laughs> <laughs> one of them is Jung and Einstein so I thought Jung was Swiss though uh, yeah Jung was Swiss Carl Jung yeah Jung. but they were they all was in uh, what is it study and work oh, in Germany yeah, they, they were friends with with this well, guy yeah. the one addicted to crack or was crack right which guy Freud uh uh-huh, Freud yeah Sigmund Freud yeah he was a student of Sigmund Freud but the uh, funny thing that they were like interdisciplinary working, so he was close friend of Einstein, mm-hmm. and Einstein was thinking about this, uh, um, what is it, the fourth dimension, how the t- how to integrate time and the, what is it called space. So they say that time is another dimension of the space, so it's a fourth dimension. 
and the basic idea comes from the Jung because Jung was talking to and every important thing in the universe has the four elements like the four elements in the they believe in the what is this called ancient Greek and the four elements of this uh, sub stereotypes that also he, like water earth yeah something and the four uh, what is the element of the psychological stereotypes uh, that Jung was developing then Einstein get the idea what if the time has a other dimension and what if the other dimension uh, what if the space has other dimension and what if the other dimension is time so they're integrated mm. so it is really really novel thing to think like that out of the box because nowadays you cannot imagine it you can imagine that the time is part of the space it's impossible to think, think like exactly, that yeah. it's getting hard probably they and they were friends with Kafka this really what is it called prominent uh, writer and they have this kind of weekly meeting like the meeting we have right now this really prominent <laughs> people but they were in the different level so yeah. <laughs> they were talking about this kind of shit okay, what's your idea what's your idea what's my idea? and yeah they could push. I do think uh, it, well definitely like other nations as well have like good like philosophers and shit um, I guess like what you said about how uh, like they work together mm. was like important and does that still happen not like today? a physics department man. Yeah, no, no one works together because it's so distant right now but at that time they were part of probably some empire I mean UK has very prominent uh, what is it called figures but they weren't philosophers they were most statistician like this Turing guy in, that invented oh, yeah. the computer in the first place yeah but they were in the different realm like they weren't philosophers and they were more well they, they, had, they had super cool writers yeah they like, are writers too Aldous Huxley he was English right Oh yeah, yeah, I heard the name, but I... he wrote Brave New World. Mm. It's a pretty, like one of the most prominent dystopias of I think it was written in the '30s or the '50s. Yeah, it was a reaction. Yeah, usually a lot of dystopian novels were like really important around right before and right after World War Two and during. Mm. So like 1984 by George Orwell. George Orwell. Oh yeah, yeah definitely. That guy. Um, like, yeah, what else? Like this thing, Childhood End. That's a dystopia. It's written in the '50s. Mm. Stuff. And they have great theories and uh, what is it? Uh, what do you call it in English? Uh, they, they they had the Iraq. Oh right, yeah, Iraq community. Yeah. <laughs> and they had this guy Adam Smith, like the Adam founder Smith. of oh, the. Yeah. He was scholar still. As, oh, yeah. yeah, Glasgow University. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Same with uh, David Hume. So they consider different country right now when they talk about they don't consider themselves as part of Britain or UK. Scotland. Yeah. No. Uh, they're just no. to, totally different. Like technically, yeah, they're part of. Mm -hmm. like England yeah, like and that. shit but like they have their own parliament not I, everything well I, I know, I'm no expert on this but I, I think they've had their own parliament since 22 years now so since 1997 so they have their own education policies their own monetary policies their own health care mm -hmm. um, you know these types of things and probably there are different they people they really want to be independent though that's mm -hmm. for sure What's but the as far as I'm aware the main reason why Scotland is not independent is because there's like oil in the Shetland area mm -hmm. and England wants to have that money so they somehow of course. like Dominate keep, keep Scotland on the leash <laughs> I think a lot of people I've met in Scotland have said yeah if uh, <clears throat> if Scotland didn't have oil mm -hmm. they'd be left alone yeah it's left <laughs> something like Middle East because the oil is not that important so their US is don't care about Middle East anymore they're going to the East Asia yeah. something like but you see this movie Braveheart? No, I, I've heard of it, but I haven't seen it. It's about the problem with the Scotland and the UK, like Britain. It won the Oscar Prize, like 1995 or six. Uh, I don't remember the actor, but he was one of the most famous. Um, no, it wasn't. I don't remember, but he was the director and the actor at the same time. Also, like Tommy Wiseau for. The oh movie. yeah, something like, exactly. <laughs> but probably a little more genius than Tommy. Yeah, maybe a little bit yeah. more. <laughs> like he talks about this problem with the Scot and UK and their different religions and they how they were in conflict with each other. Actually, the Scotland could get the independent at that era, maybe 500, 600 years ago. But this hero, that the leader of the Scottish people, get betrayed by his own like peasants people oh, like, right. for just a small point something like that and they were <laughs> captured and killed him for what 
a small coin. Yeah, because what they does were that mean? because they were peasants and they like kind of people from the UK government like and suggest that if you give you money, will you hand him over to us, something like that. Oh. Because it was kind of popular and working with these poor people, like the peasants and the people weren't like very powerful. Do you remember the name of this guy? Uh, Was it Robert the Bruce or some shit? Uh, yeah. My phone, yeah. <laughs> Actually, I don't know where my phone is, but we can search it. Like the movie Braveheart, if you search it, you can like find the yeah. real actor. Uh, th- these things were all explained to me when I was in Scotland. I have a lot of friends who are like really into the Scottish history, but like I forgot that shit like this. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> wasn't interesting. Like how long are these whole podcasts? Sorry. How long are they? However long you want. Okay. They have to finish the. Yeah, oh, the fucking Christ. The physics yeah. part. Oh well, you had your input though. <laughs> yeah, I had my input. Yeah. So maybe we're still talking when you're done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. Yeah, probably. Hey. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. The no physicists problem. leave the room. I, no. <laughs> mark the mark the time. Ten forty. I yeah. can't leave the room. <laughs> I will see you when thanks for coming. Do you want to keep going or? Uh, yeah, we can talk. No okay. more. Shit. There were some things I was gonna ask you there, but I I forgot. The conversation was kind of all over the place. Yeah, I know. It was but just going from oh well. the different places. I'm gonna try this pretty soon. Oh. Yeah, as sure. soon as I'm done with with this. <laughs> yeah. No. Do you want to try this? Yeah. yeah, go ahead. It's a I already had two beers in the game, so oh, I'm okay. served. Yeah. How much did the beer cost over there? Six dollars. Six dollars. Not bad. I mean, for the. Was the it price. like a? Yeah, it like was a one can. like this. Yeah, it's what's can they pour it in there? Okay, kind of like at the um, the fucking uh quad main quad. Oh uh-huh, yeah. Something. Dude, that seems like such a long time ago. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Imagine, imagine that like, sit, sitting outside in a t-shirt again like what the fuck I was like minus 20 <laughs> yeah <laughs> we were so having bad. the sun rest <laughs> yeah man. oh bad <laughs> but this game it was interesting for me how they play have self control like in the hockey they beat each other as hard as they could and they hit each other as hard as they can they push each other and they didn't get angry like, they didn't get this thing as personal you know, if someone they push you in the street, you go, what the fuck, you know, punch yeah. it. And it happened in the worst case ever, and they were just cool, okay. <laughs> Don't worry about it, they just move on. Well, like, have you watched, uh, like, football, like, soccer? Uh, fo- no, you know, I mean, those guys, like, they're, like, faking all the fucking time, and, like, someone, like, touches their hair, and they freak out, like, rah, Oh, rah. yeah. I think that's so interesting how there's, like, a complete different culture behind how you react to physical contact depending on the sport. Yeah. Like in American, okay, in American football, rugby, it's like kind of part of it, right? But in like hockey, okay, it's also like kind of part of it. But people like, they don't really like go crazy over it. I think it's so weird how... See, there's a lot of advantage in the football if you can get a, what is it called, fall or penalty or even a free kick. So there's a lot of advantage. But in hockey, probably there is no advantage in... Yeah, I don't know. I guess there's a psychological, if you like win in the... But it was really interesting. Sometimes it felt really insulting, like the way they punch each other, and it's, but they acted really good, like nothing happened. Yeah, it's like everyday bullshit, yeah. whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want it. Did you see, like, did they have the stuff where they kind of like go to the side, two players, take off their gloves and their helmet, and they like have a fight? Oh, yeah. Did you see that? Uh, no, it didn't happen here. Oh, okay. but probably it's happening in the National League. But I remember I was a kid and I played the video game of the hockey. It was <laughs> part of the game. Like you actually fight during the game and you continue scoring. <laughs> so what the shit is that? Yeah, when was this game? Like 1983? <laughs> yeah, the way I was 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not kidding. I remember the FIFA 1998 and NBA, and NBA 2001. Like the Kobe Bryant was really prominent in the Lakers. And 1998 was the World Cup. I remember it was Sega, even if there was no PlayStation 1. You know the Sega, this console, like the old one? Like Nintendo? Uh, it's something... You never see Sega? No, I've heard of the company, but I don't know. No, I don't Se- know they made Sega consoles. was a console. I thought they were just a game developer, though. No, they were console and they developed their own game and there was like a tape you put into the console. A tape? Uh, what, a tape? A cassette? A uh, cassette, yeah, cassette. Bro, yeah. what the hell? It was like a cassette, you put it on the console and you put it with the joystick. Oh and before God. that, there was a micro, so the Sega was kind of more visual. The micro was really, really simple. Like, 
it consists of some circles like a score something like that the game was super super what is it called simple okay and it was the first console i think the micro all right maybe 20 i don't know three years ago so you were born in 92 90 yeah something like 92 so was that is that 98 is that like the first memory you have of a video game yeah. okay my first memory of a video game is probably playing f1 2002 oh i played that game i remember there like in the f1 2002 if you crash and you roll <laughs> the screen goes like black and white you know like the old analog tv when uh -huh. it goes like fuzzy yeah, you know that like that happened that's probably like my f earliest video game memory but there is two games i always remember one of them is doom one because Doom 1 was the first three-dimensional game, I think, ever or the one I played. I was in the elementary school the third year. I had this computer, you know, it was Pentium. They called the computer uh, the power base on the Pentium 1, Pentium 2. Pentium. Okay. So at this Pentium 2, and I ran the first three-dimensional game on this computer. It was totally different from the micro second everything before I played. But nowadays, there are different games coming to the market but they're not that revolutionary. Like there was a two dimension and three dimension. Mm. So there was huge difference between these two. Yeah. Like nowadays it's just about the script, it was the visual effects, something I like guess. that. Yeah. I mean, I'm no longer a gamer, so I have no idea like what's revolution anymore and what's not. I think maybe the visual reality, but it doesn't feel that good. I have you tried it? Yeah, it's sure, visual reality, but- Where? Uh, like you can play with the PS4. If you have PS4, you get this uh, goggles. Really? For the, yeah. It's like five and half five hundred dollars. Not that expensive. Okay. You put it in the what is it? Attach it to the PS4, and you can play the three dimension. It doesn't feel, you know, authentic. Good. Yeah. And first of all, you get this dizziness, and you want to throw up. First really? time I play, I want like to especially throw like what about like driving games, like driving yeah. virtual reality, it's like literally. Yeah, it's really bad because you get disoriented. You don't yeah. know where is the space. Like, where are you actually in the space? So you get disoriented. You want to throw up. It's kind of that kind of a bad feeling. And there was another about StarCraft. It was like a strategic one. It was cool too. Alright. But the fun I remember this disorientation. When you try alcohol, you know what time is it or what uh, where are you or uh, mm. what time is it. So you <laughs> almost know it and you don't completely lose touch with this reality. But the first time I smoke weed not, not the first one, it's certain that has an effect actually on me. I was freaking, freaking scared. I was, I thought that I'm dying actually. I got this heartbeat. You know, I, I had this feeling that I get old and I'm frozen in the crystal, <laughs> something like that. I'm not kidding. I thought that I dying in the frozen crystal and I'm like very, very old. Then my jaw started to kind of like clench. Yeah, clench and lock. Oh shit, and, dude. <laughs> At the same time, as I was high, I was thinking how this shit works, like how the, the beat actually works on your mind. I want to decode it, but my mind was everywhere in the play. I was going really, really crazy. <laughs> <laughs> then I came back, and so the reason it has a strong because you don't actually lose touch with the space, and you lose touch with the time. So you don't know what is the time, because the time is strange, like the five minutes is two hours for you. Okay, yeah. And you don't know where you are, and it's super, super scary. If you have time or the place, like any of them, it helps you a lot. But if you lose touch with both of them, you so okay. We were talking about virtual reality. Does this relate to virtual rea reality? No, no. I, I got the idea because when you have this uh, goggle for virtual reality, you get this kind of feeling of disorientation. Oh, yeah, okay. So you lose your touch with the real world, like the space. So you go somewhere between this game and this yeah, real okay. game. So you don't know where is the actual space, where is the actual time. It's so all right, let's say you're in your living room and you're playing with these goggles and shit. Are you kind of like in and out of like, okay, you kind of know you're like in your living room? Yeah, because you, you got, know you're also in the game. Like, is that kind of how Yeah, it is? because you don't sit actually when you're playing with this visual reality. You you're, stand. You're standing yeah. and you're walking kind of. But do you have a control in your hand? Uh, it's not a joystick, it's just something you holding your hands so like what like a plastic device or no it's like a the same material as joystick but it's kind of small you can that's grab that's how it. you move like you hold yeah it. yeah you can grab it actually with this what is it called and uh, 
you know the joystick appears in front of you in the virtual reality yeah you see the joystick in the virtual what world. it's something that's see. so fucking yeah weird. it's so weird <laughs> imagine in real life you had a joystick like in your eyes and you had to like think to move it and that would make you move yeah. your body <laughs> i know that's so fucking weird actually no i think about i remember a dream like i don't know it was three or four years ago i dream of weird shit ever so <laughs> I saw two poles, you know, these dancing poles, they have this stripper, yeah. like, remember, I don't know, the unlimited kilometer of this dancing pole. In the dark universe, like, in the vacuum universe, like, the background is dark, you're in the middle of a space, and there are two poles. Mm -hmm. I was, like, uh, grabbing one of the poles with my, you know, like, left hand and the other with my right hand, and I was, like, stationary, so I could actually see what's going on in front of me. Okay. Then I last control one of the poles. So my field of view actually increased. So I didn't have the limitation when I put the two, uh, what is it called? Uh, this dancing pole. Yeah. <laughs> so it gave me some kind of freedom. But when I lost the another pole, it was too much. You know, when you have too much freedom, you're kind of lost oh, okay. in the situation. I could rotate in the space, but I didn't have a reference point. Then I didn't have a reference point. I didn't mm. know what the shit is going on. Then I woke up and I was kind of thinking about the dream. You know, what the fuck these two poles were? Then I then I thought something about like the one of the poles should be the what is it called? A space. The other sh pole should be time. Ah uh -huh, yeah. So there are two curtains. Like they say, space and time is, are two curtains of the what is it called perception. Okay. If you can um, get rid of these two curtains, you can see better. Like if you get rid of the space, you can be in anywhere, so it gives you a kind of freedom. If you can be and get rid of the time, you can travel through the time, it gives you another freedom. But to me, it, it was like that you need at least one of them, because if you're not attached to anything, yeah. too much freedom is not a good thing. Okay. You know, yeah. you need something to attach to. <laughs> but it was a real shit. You know? That's crazy, man. <laughs> Because, you know, like, I was just thinking, like, a lot of, like, philosophers or whatever, they have, like, this one thing on life that they can, like, understand differently. <laughs> yeah, I know. Like, I don't know, let's say it's fucking, like, Rene Descartes and his whole, like, thing on the, the logic, you know, getting rid of the poison apple mm. and all this kind of stuff. So maybe you just had, like, a moment where he's like, oh, fuck. Yeah, I woke up, yeah, I found it. <laughs> yeah, like, like, have you researched if that stuff's already been thought of? So... It mostly comes from unconsciously because you have all the data probably in that time i was reading about this kind of shit like the uh -huh. philosophy psychology yeah. but i didn't know the relationship with, between them and i couldn't analyze them because in the when you conscious it's too much for your brain to what is it interpret and analyze all of this kind of thing and you cannot translate it into the language that you can actually understand when you sleep the thing happened in the dream it translated to the way that is understandable for you and you get rid of this anxiety because if you cannot handle something, it brings anxiety. Yeah, okay. So in the dream, it's kind of translate that you can understand better. You know, uh, this uh, chain of the carbon and uh, what they call it? Hexon. Carbon? Yeah, car you know, this uh, chain of six carbon, yeah, what they okay, call yeah. it. It's really important uh, figure in chemistry. Yeah. So there was a scientist in like, I don't know, 200 years or whatever. But that time, all the scientists uh, thought that the formula of the, what is it called, atom and the molecular should be a... A chain? Uh, not a chain, like a, a string. Okay. So they didn't know that the formula can exist as a chain. Oh, okay. Then this scientist sleep and he dreams of the snake. And the snake goes and comes and touches his tail with his mouth. And he wakes up and says, okay, whatever, there is a chain to the formula in the chemistry. Oh. Then it's a model. Then they test the model and it actually it works. works. They understand, yeah. okay, the molecular can form a chain. So sometimes it's like that. You it's really struggle. You have the, all the information, but you cannot touch this mm. solution. Because your mind is kind of, I don't know, maybe tired. Overwhelmed or, or something. Yeah, overwhelmed or yeah. tired. Then you sleep and everything makes That's sense. That's so cool though. Like how that works man <laughs> sometimes they say if you have a lot of information and you want to decide about something really difficult just leave it for two weeks after two weeks automatically you can decide better because 
you kind of detach from this uh, difficulty of interpreting everything your mind in the background like a, you know in the computer in the background it does a lot of things your mind actually in the background does all the calculation mm. if you give it time and after a certain time you can push it more authentic actually okay to how old were you at the time uh it wasn't that far away like during my university thing maybe it's like roughly my age now yeah six years or seven years ago something like that and yeah, okay. and i had a friend that we had this kind of discussion like i told you about him he was like the most genius person i ever saw like had a gold medal in olympia like biology like uh, in the world level something like that yeah and we used to have this kind of discussion and talk about this philosophical and psychological question for like hours like i mean six seven hours like when we were drunk and smoking at the same time uh -huh. one night we were talking like it started from this like kind of conversation and after eight hours we were talking about the ethics uh, i think i told you yeah, about ethics uh, the, robots, robots. yeah <laughs> some shit and we were arguing like we were arguing this arguing no this is not true this is right this is we should treat the robot like this like the computer <laughs> should, what the fuck <laughs> i hate you <laughs> i'm going up oh that's so funny but it's so crazy to think that like six to seven years ago you were talking about this shit six <laughs> to seven years ago man i was like 14 13 yeah, playing yeah. fucking call of duty do you know call of duty the video game Oh, yeah, yeah. It's like some music. shooting game. I used to yeah. play so much Call of Duty when I was. It was like 2012, 13. Actually, I was playing at the time as well. Like, <laughs> yeah. I always play Call of Duty. Always fucking. Can I have some? Yeah, sure. Fucking I actually did it. Black <laughs> Ops 1 and Last... all this dumb shit. That's like all I did back then. It was crazy. I went to school. I had a great time in school. I did pretty good back then because back then I still had grades. Or I, I had grades even at that age. And yeah, and then you just go home and play Call of Duty with my friends. That's like all I did. It's Actually, but crazy how things when I was high school, I'm not kidding. Two nights I slept in the what is it called? You had this place. You went there and played video games. Uh, I don't know what you call it in English. That there was game net. A what? Game net. Did you have game net? There was a place that like a cafe kind of. Yeah, thing? cafe. Yeah, yeah okay. it's a cafe. The computer mean. were connected, and you played this uh, Counter Attack or the yeah. Call of Duty thing. I actually yeah. slept two nights at this cafe with my friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was hired. We were playing like 24 hours, something like that. Then my first exposure to this kind of books when I was like in... I wanted to enter the university because my sister used to read something like that. Like, I don't know, Nisha Schopenhauer. Mm -hmm. Then he, she kind of introduced me to... Oh, Is she older than you or younger? Four years older. Four years older, um, okay. Then she introduced me oh, it's a good book if you want to read something because i already know there is something wrong with this my belief and everything like it kind of lost face maybe 20 years ago because after, before that because of the family and the society and everything so i believe in something mm. then something when i was sure didn't make sense to me so i had this question if you're going to the heaven what happens to the people like in japan What's their problem? They didn't do anything and they didn't have a choice. Why should, should they go to their hell? <laughs> so, you know, this kind of question, they, you don't have an answer and your parents doesn't have an answer to and because they just believe it. And if you refer to this every, I don't know, holy or unholy book, something like that, you don't find the answer. Mm -hmm. And you kind of alone because the people around you doesn't think like it, think something like that. They just yeah, accept right. it. Yeah. Or they don't even yeah and, don't even cross yeah because mind. then you s what is it s suspect yourself I mean, what if I'm wrong what if mm -hmm. there is another thing and you kind of feel alone when you feel alone so you're vulnerable then you find the book like I don't know book like Nietzsche or something like that or the Spinoza like mm -hmm. he's the one I really like you say okay this kind of line thinks not exactly but, but in, similar similar in the line with you and say okay it's a good sign there are some people that think alike so it's not totally wrong. Then you go further, further, further. And okay, it was total bullshit the first thing you were. Yeah. But it you should get lucky. Like the thing we were talking the last time, that there is no free will to it. So I was born. I didn't know what the fuck is going on. Like, <laughs> it was like a black, what is it, whiteboard. And the family, society and everything right in it. So you believe in this kind of shit. Then I had a chance. Maybe it was genetic. Maybe I had... I don't say I was smarter, maybe I was more curious about something. So I needed to ask questions. Mm -hmm. Then I met a new right people that introduced me to the right resources. 
But how did you find those people? It's by chance. By chance. It, the first exposure is by chance. Then you then find you it interesting if it's based on your, I don't know, maybe talents on your biology, everything. If you like this thing you're exposed to, you go after it. Yeah, that's right. Because you know what you're looking for. Yeah. More solid, so solid. by chance you're exposed to the situation that first time, you know, there is a guy thinks like that. There is a book like that, like my sister told me about this kind of shit. Mm -hmm. But maybe I, there was a chance I wasn't exposed to that. Mm. Then it f could go to the, mm, yeah. to a totally different place. Yeah. So in the, what is it? Big view, big picture. Actually, I was struggling with this like one week ago again. Well, it's really hard to incorporate this free will and this determinant six. Mm. In the big picture, you see everything is like come from the outside or it's out of your control and you didn't have the consciousness and you couldn't do the metacognition. I mean, the first time you probably you can do the metacognition is at the age of 16 or 18. Before that, you don't know what the hell is going on in the world. I think maybe a bit earlier, but like full time. Yeah, full time. Yeah. It's like, yeah, roughly like 16. So it takes time. 15. And I was thinking, okay, this is happening, but now I have this consciousness that I can think about this kind of thing that happened to me. But this kind of thinking that, yeah, I don't know how to put it in English. I think about the previous uh, sequence of the events, mm -hmm. it's itself a uh, kind of result of the past experience. But at the same time, you feel free. You say, okay, I'm deciding, I'm deciding. But in the picture, you're not free. I mean, you have an impact in the small circle, but in the big circle, mm. it is. So this thing happened to me that I don't want to mention the name. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I was really angry, f maybe for t first two hours or three hours. Because I was thinking that people should take responsibility of what they're saying, what they're doing, something like that. Then I thought in the bigger picture, I said, Well, not really. Because it's not their acts. They acting in this way because what happened before? But, yeah, because it happened before, they code it in the same way. Yeah. Uh -huh. When I think like that, I get really calm. I say, okay, it is how the world works, and there is nothing you can do about it. But again, when I think in the close distance, I say, yeah, maybe I could do something, or maybe the other person could do something differently. Yeah. It's really, really hard to incorporate this yeah, kind of yeah, thing together. Yeah. Because then, when when bad things happen to you through other people. You don't know how to balance like full forgiveness and not. Yeah, exactly. That, that's fucking hard. <laughs> so then you think about just that principle for a yeah. long time and you don't even think about what happened to you. <laughs> and you don't know if the things you do are meaningful or not. Yeah. It's like a, you know, chandra. I mean, there is a hot debate still between every probably philosopher, psychologist. Some of them are determined since some of them believe in free will. Like Noam Chomsky, he's the, what is it called? Uh, he supports the free will thing. Really? And uh, not in the free free will, but he's not a uh, totally deterministic. Because so I think he's compatibilist. Because because that's like what's in between. Oh, I don't know. Uh -huh. oh, maybe that's it. Yeah. Because deterministic says that you don't have a control and you have a white what is it board and people write on it, the society write on it, and there is no absolute value. No, there is no absolute ethical values. There is no absolute anything. Mm -hmm. So, for example, freedom is not an absolute value. Okay. One of the same determines it. Every ethics you have, you made it so the society can work and hold together. So it's good for the society. You have this kind of ethics, like the murder is a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like helping the poor is a, a good, good thing. thing, because first of all, you feel good when you help the poor. You feel good, so it gets uh, you get rid of the anxiety, and the poor doesn't. What is the kind of portents against the rich? Okay. So, but in the view of Noam Chomsky, it's not like that. Noam Chomsky, there is a certain category in the mind that it is decoded for the freedom. So people are coded to go after freedom. So in that regard... That's deterministic though. Uh, if you're already... Because he always says all this stuff, especially when it comes to language that you're born with, it, like, mm, like a code yeah, in your head maybe to I, create language. Yeah, maybe I put it in the bad way. How can I say it? Like... Mm, and my point is that 
the deterministic deterministic that are really really like left they think there's nothing and everything is a result of the society okay. like there is nothing uh, uh authentic in yourself like as a human you don't have anything authentic okay so it becomes in existence as a result of the society and everything and it is as a result of the world as a nature in the mm -hmm. like, bigger picture but the people like Chomsky are not that left left they think there's something authentic in the human instead of like you sh want to go to after like freedom mm -hmm. you see like the way he says that it is natural that you go after freedom if okay. I can say it in the right way yeah well, I know this is a topic <laughs> they're still discussing about it really. well yeah it's gonna be discussed probably for a very mm -hmm. long time yeah. and then there is a guy like Wittgenstein he comes and says all of his bullshit <laughs> yeah he says like this really yeah he comes and he writes the book the first one and he says I solve everything in philosophy and psychology and he doesn't do anything about psychology for 30 years he goes to building home and construction and painting and he goes to the I don't know alpine like hiking everything for 30 years okay because he, he had the notion that it was kind of maybe determined say look, you have this limitation barrier because of the language and because of the language you cannot ever have access to the reality I thought that's stuff that Chomsky said though uh, Chomsky have, have some ideas from the Wittgenstein because Wittgenstein is the first linguistic ever when did he like when was he popular with his works uh, he died like after World War Two. So did he come up with the stuff like in the 20s and 30s or yeah, like maybe 30s yeah first 30s okay. 40s so he was the first actual linguistic when they categorize the philosopher they say there is a um, what is it Plato Aristotle you Aristotelian, uh, Aristotelian. Mm -hmm. there are two major ones like the two concepts yeah then it comes to the Kant he's one of the prominent then yeah. saying this uh, first one is Wittgenstein didn't he also come with like concepts behind art like um, the, like the oh, I don't know I remember doing this stuff in university there's like some Wittgensteinian type of criteria. I don't remember if it was for like classifying what is art and what isn't. Anyways, yeah. Because which, uh, which he refers to as a language is not a verbal language only. The yeah, art is kind of a language. Yeah, it's in the head. Music is kind of a language. Like yeah. he categorized language into different things. But again, he said, because there is a limitation and this limitation based on the biology, you cannot ever understand the True. actual truth. So, the question like this is there a God it is nonsense because the language formulates this question you cannot think otherwise and you see everything in cause and effect thing you're in the circle you ask this question for 1000 years you still won't get an answer because you need different language if you have different language you might yeah, be can answer, you can answer. Uh, so basically he's, he's saying that you're we're asking too many questions that our language can't even yeah because it's like a bias in the system he said there's a bias in the system you produce the wrong question mm. <laughs> the question is wrong you should even the nature of language is biased like have you ever heard like have you ever really thought of this like have you ever heard of a statement that's not biased it's it's impossible to not have bias. Yeah, like to say it's cold it could be cold for me but it won't be cold for you yeah exactly it's super super hard subjective to yeah exactly uh convey what you mean and I understand the same thing what you mean yeah and uh, if you read his books he formulated this kind of thing in the mathematical form like he transformed the language in mathematical form and to show where is the language has deficiency and uh, what's wrong with the language how can you improve it so it transformed the statement mm -hmm. then you in language you have the statement he converted to the mathematics so it's the genius of his work Okay. So he comes with this kind of first book after 30 years, he kind of changed his mind and said, maybe you can find answer to some of the, what is it, question, but still, as a human, you over credit yourself because humans think they can do anything, they can think about anything and they're right, and it's over credit mm. to the human thing. Maybe there's no answer to it. And you just, you know, so moving in the circle yeah mm, tricky stuff just kind of 
I mean, I really wanted to go after linguistics, psycholinguistics, something like that, but it didn't happen. It's super, super hard. Like it's uh, like hard to get in. It's super hard to get in, and it's super hard to understand it. Yeah. Because you should be smart enough to understand the mathematics in the first place in the high level, that's the lower level of the high school scene. And you can bridge between the language and this kind of logic. And you can kind but of do you think it. that um, nowadays, even as like a, like you could call it like cottage industry, like you're just researching and writing in your own time. Like, do you think you can still be, be a prominent like thinker, even though you don't maybe have credentials, like you don't have a PhD or... I mean, getting PhD things. or something like it doesn't help with anything because it doesn't, first of all, make you smarter and it's just a labor work. So it kind of kills the creativity. You can be prominent, but because the science is so detailed right now and you don't have a Renaissance scientist, you know the Renaissance scientists knew about everything and they said this Chomsky is the last Renaissance scientist that he knows about politics, he knows about the psychology, he knows about philosophy. It's so hard to get. You should read a combination of the books and probably in 20 years, this AI and this uh, yeah, artificial intelligence change over. everything. Mm. Unless you combine the human being, the creativity with the process of the AI, and then you can reach another level. But there are a lot of information, and there are a lot of unwanted information that censor, what is it called, censor, you say it in English, kind of prevent you to get the authentic creativity. Okay. But I saw some people have, like, very very intelligent creative people that come with this authentic yeah ideas but it's they're so possible yeah there are few you should be super smart mm. for that or just lucky that we were born with you're lucky game. super <laughs> smart and you sh should think out of the box mm. because you most of the times you think in the box and the idea you come come up with you think they're new but they're not new you just analyze them from yeah because i bet people. there are a lot of things that the way i see the world and life and if I did my research, I could realize, oh shit, that many people have already published stuff on this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It happened to me a lot of time. I come with the idea and say, what the fuck? The other guy come with the same idea, the better idea. Yeah, and, better than you, yeah. and they develop. Yeah, like 150 years ago. <laughs> Actually, I know that about this consciousness that I told you, I told Rebecca as well that I want to really work if I have the time in future, that decoding what is consciousness. Uh, what's the nature of it, how it emerged, how, yeah. what kind of phenomenon it is. Exactly. I had this idea without reading this book the, from this German uh, neuroscientist. I said for a system to be conscious, it should first of all have different parts and the different parts should have interaction with each other and the different parts shouldn't have the same, uh, what is it called, identity probably. Okay. So if you have a system that is not monotonic, it's not a one single unit, it has different parts okay. and the different parts have interaction with them. From the interaction, something emerged like, and the image of something from this interaction is consciousness. So it's a kind of byproduct of the system, but the byproduct comes back into the loop and it affects the system itself. So mm -hmm. it changed the, uh, how the system works. I had this initial idea uh, and it comes from the statistical analysis because in statistical analysis you have two factors and these two factors have interaction and the interaction emerges to the third factor then you put it in the analysis so then I read this book and the guy came same exactly thing. with the same thing mm. and they came with the formula actually they call it the fee value or fee number okay they can calculate uh, how much consciousness uh, what is it, a living thing has so they calculate the number of neurons the number of the oh, okay. uh, part of the brain you have like the frontal yeah exactly yeah that makes and the nature more. of the connection and they have a model and the supercomputer actually calculate this and it comes at, after like very very complicated, complicated yeah. thing they come with a fee number okay and this fee number determines the level of consciousness, consciousness. so okay. right now you can say for example the goldfish has this number of feet, so probably in that level he can understand pain. So then you can build on this fee number the ethics. So if oh. you have the higher fee number, so it kind of 
feel pain more than the other. Yeah, okay. And the human, because of this, we have the large, largest brain, we have a lot of neurons, there are a lot of interaction, and they, we have, what is it, different entities and different, what is it called, sections in the brain. We have the highest number for this P value. The highest As, of all species that have been ever tested. It's so difficult, they did it for maybe two or three. Only? Yeah. Oh, because it takes a long time to do and it. Even for the human brain, they couldn't do it. They yeah, because you test on a human, that's like they did. They did it for 300, no, it's not, you need a lot of information. They did for a simplest living thing, it's like a, a fish living in the, what is the sea? It has 320 neurons only. Okay. They calculated for this entity, it takes one year with the computer. So for the human... How do they test that? Like all these different procedures, like they're crazy because, like the actually the Google this big company provides the money for this project for yeah. this neuroscientist, yeah. and they have team of one thousand people in this lab, and so they have people from I don't know mathematics, physics, every biology, every every department. And they come with a model and they test the model in the very simple data, and if it works, they try the model in the more advanced living organism mm -hmm. but the same for the human brain they need a quantum computer that the google again is well, fine, yeah guess. they're yeah. going to build it with the quantum computer the level of process goes really really high and again with that it probably takes i don't know maybe a lot of lot of years to come with the <laughs> level of consciousness and how the mind works because you should first have the map of the what every neuron and every interactions in the what is it called brain and for that you should need the MRI and fMRI mm. so you should MRI every every section in like a I don't know one millimeters squares you should gather all of this data and you should know the relationship between the neurons and everything and put it down to the one so it's chaotic thing. Mm. But the thing is that they know how to do it right now. <laughs> because 20 years ago, if you ask a question, does the duck feel anything? Or the does have a consciousness? No one could answer it. So, uh, because it's a subjective question. When you have to say, do you feel pain? Do you feel happy? Does, do you feel anything? <laughs> it's a subjective question. But right now, they transport it to the objective world. So they mm. can come up with something actually authentic. <laughs> Oh. And this thing actually, the theory eliminates the existence of the soul. Because, like the old philosopher, even Descartes has this theory of uh, mind and body. They thought the mind is something different from the body. Right. No, they say it's not something different because the consciousness or the mind or the soul, what you mean it. So the other name of consciousness is soul, the other name of consciousness is mind. It actually emerged from this material brain. <laughs> so they can reject this mind-body problem. Uh -huh. And they say, okay, there is no soul and you don't need soul to have consciousness. It's one of the very, very big implementation. <laughs> Mind-blowing. How do you come across, like, how do you know this? Actually, I was thinking about this kind of thing of consciousness and everything. I went after the books that was related. I searched it in Goodreads, like consciousness, something. Goodreads. Like Goodreads in the Google, uh, what is it? Google, like in the engine searches. Like I searched consciousness, something like that. And I come with the list of the books regarding this topic. Then I read some review about them. Then I chose some books that were related. Then okay. I read the book. <laughs> yeah, what a smart guy. <laughs> That's crazy. I appreciate the dedication. Yeah. Well, something is interesting, you go after it. Yeah. That's right. But still, when you read this book, there are some people who do not want to believe in any shit, and they're like, you know, not religious, but spiritual religious thing. Mm -hmm. They provide them with this evidence, they still don't believe you. Yeah. That's the sad thing about it. Oh, there's something I was going to say about Chomsky before. So you said he was the la he's like the last like renaissance Some people regard it because he was in everything. 
But th- surely you can have a, a, a new young, like, intellectual. But do you think by the time they reach a certain age that the computers will take over? Yeah, take over and probably it's a less chance that individual can emerge as a Noam Chomsky because he's 19 years old. His mind is a like library. He read every book. Every book you mentioned, the guy read. It's important. I wonder if there's some books I've read that he No, no, I know, but the book that's related yeah, to this. Yeah, I know. <laughs> like the prominent books, you know? Yeah. And no, he not exact- bullshit fiction. Yeah, fiction. and he exactly know in what page what the author said. When you s- listen to the, what is the podcast and the YouTube videos, they ask, okay, in, the, in that book, like, the author says, it. no, it's wrong. In that book, like, the author says, it. this is in that book. What the fuck? How can you know that? And he's still smart, like he's 19 and he's super, super smart. Yeah, it's fucking crazy. There's like a most recent and interview on YouTube. He gets a right? lot of dedication, like for 90 years you study. It's impossible. He's 91 now, I think he was born 1928. Uh, like something like, what's his, he should be 80 to us, 90 something like yeah. that. Yeah, that's crazy. I saw like the most recent interview of him on YouTube and he has a beard now. Mm. <laughs> You know, <laughs> I think he's gotten so old he can't shave anymore. <laughs> well, he has this curious mind. First of all, he was psychologist in first place, then he become politician. Mm. And the most important, he was linguist first. Yeah. yeah, he came with the most important thing in linguistic psychology. It's called LAD. Like it's a system how the child learns the language. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the it was kind of like this. Uh, I think it was like the the barriers of knowledge mm. and like how that changes like the human experience. So like you experience a lot of things that you don't create language with in your head, mm. but yet you would still understand understand it, it through language. Mm. Like when you see someone like I don't know taking a shit in the street, you don't say in your head, "Oh my god, he's taking a shit," no. but you still say it kind of like indirectly. Yeah, yeah. So he came up with that and kind of like that. There's like a biological code in our heads that creates us language. to create. It's not language, language acquisition. Language system or something yeah. like that this thing is super interesting and he stuff. says that everyone has the language like the language this way you, you talk english i take persian or the other girl speaks like french they are the facet of the language yeah you have the language it takes form like every person every child until age of eight they have the what is the chance to learn the language automatically you don't need to teach them anything until eight yeah, until it, if you're exposed to the language, you learn it. Or maybe it was younger, I don't know, seven or eight. You don't need... It's, now, if I want to learn a language, I should learn the language. Yeah, have to actually, like... But this language there. acquisition system is that if you just expose the child to the society, it learns it without <laughs> any difficulty. This is the main idea. And it says it's like a, you know... It's like a matter. Language is like a matter. In the child, it, it just get the form. So it develops to English, it develops to French, it develops to, I don't know, something like mm-hmm. else. And the reason after age of seven, you cannot learn automatically because this neurons kind of get fixed. They're not that flexible anymore. Okay. Because you get exposed to one thing and the neuron branches in a certain way. <laughs> okay. But at, after age of seven, there is a, what is it called? Very not cut off point turning point in the branching of nor and uh, what is it in neurobiology this is kind of get fixed the other uh, important point is age of 20 and the other is 30. so by so age you're of, fucked. yeah <laughs> exactly so by age of 30 if you want to have a specific personality if you have a specific worldview everything you should develop it by age of 30 because after age of 30 it's not for all people, but for 95% it's like that. It's almost impossible to change a person after age of 30 because, I mean, the neurons branching, the neurons kind of reviving as what they produce, but the rate is so slow. Mm. And the long-term memory, I mean, your mood changes for sure because the mood comes from the neurotransmitter. This, you know, the chemical that works, uh, bring the message between the neurons yeah the quantity and the volume of this neurotransmitter changes always but the personality your attitude your belief based on the branching and the pattern of the neurons and it is the long-term memory Mm -hmm. the long-term memory is the way 
the neuron branching, the short term memory is the way neurotransmitters work. Okay. So the branching doesn't change that much at, after age of 30. Damn. So it's difficult. <laughs> Some people, like very, you know, optimistic people in the T said, no, you can change forever. Like in a 40, 50, we had a case like the man in the age of 60 become the rocket star of fuck from <laughs> the trash car. I don't know, sounds bullshit like that. Maybe. Some people, few, yeah. few, or maybe the guy actually had a potential. <laughs> he was when he was younger, but didn't use it. Yeah, he was in the I don't know bullshit country. Then they move it to the Bullsh- US, <laughs> and he become rocket star. It's possible. <laughs> but in general, it's really difficult. Yeah. Right? While you have time, you should work on it. You feel like for you, time is running out. Then, based on that principle, mm, you know, this is the problem when you know about the system. The system changes in nature, you know? Okay. I mean, yeah, I can understand that I'm different from eight years ago because eight years ago I was more versatile, maybe. Yeah. But no, maybe I have more rigid concepts. And you can see in the very famous scientists as well, like, again, Einstein, he wrote four papers, like the breaks, you know, groundbreaking papers of the Einstein. They came when he was in age of 30, like 20 to 30. Like about the relativity, about like discovering the molecule. And after age of 30 or 35, he was developing the first ideas. He mm-hmm. didn't come with something really, really novel. And it's true with the other scientists as well. <laughs> and we have 10 years left, mm-hmm. man. I mean, it's not or absolute. Nine, nine now. <laughs> Actually, if you read the Schopenhauer books, it's really, really interesting. Um, I mean, he's by far one of the most smartest guy ever in the history. The way he sees the distance is incredible. He said, you see the book from the author, like he's really famous. And the picture of the author is in the old age. Mm-hmm. Like the... Even Schopenhauer, if you see the picture, he's in the old age, like the Einstein is in the old age. That's right, yeah. Then why they picture the authors in the old age? It doesn't mean that they come with the idea in the old age. Mm. They come with the idea in the young age. But it took for people, the generation, to understand it. So it took for other people 30 or 40 years Mm -hmm. to understand it. So by the time the other people understand the idea, they were already old. So they published the book with the face of their... And they were old. But like Schopenhauer wrote his book, like the world that I see and I will, like the most important one, when he was twenty eight years old. Crazy thing. What the fuck? I wonder if the shit I've written since I'm eighteen, if that has any value at all. I mean, (laughs) again, there is no absolute thing. Like the Nietzsche wrote the book Zaratustra, this thing in the age of forty, but probably the ideas came about. And why he wrote it? Because. Before it, he had the suicide. Really? He, he did suicide before writing the Zarathustra, and the suicide changed his worldview. So mm-hmm. there was a big scene in his life. Then mm-hmm. he transformed into this, writing this kind of book. Okay. Yeah, but the thing is that... <laughs> try faster. <laughs> yeah, fuck, man. Time's running out, man. I mean, maybe all the thing it's talked about maybe they're not true after 20 years they say okay this is bullshit <laughs> we find that there is a they're new yeah uh, neurons are branching forever <laughs> like something like that but for now or maybe there's some drug that will allow you yeah to maybe they accelerate the yeah. activity of the brain <laughs> it's possible yeah. i told them about this helmet because they nowadays they're doing it they put a helmet on the military of the u.s it's gonna turn off the amygdala and then they turn off this amygdala, the soldier doesn't feel fear. Yeah, emotion. And, yeah. mm-hmm. and they become more accurate because if you don't have fear, you become more accurate in aiming. How do you turn off the amygdala? Uh, like this uh, helmet, yeah, yeah, they call it. It sends a frequency that is the opposite of the frequency that works in, inside the amygdala. Oh my so they God. decoded the amygdala frequency and the electricity, what is it level and everything physics about it. And they counterbalance it, actually. Have you ever heard of the TV show Black Mirror? Oh, uh, yeah. That's literally yeah. that shit. Uh, the helmet they put and they see zombies, something like well, that. Well, for example, I, don't, I haven't seen all episodes, but I know there's one where they like uh, have exactly. this chip behind the ear, like where you can remember everything and can like turn it off or on or like yeah, rip exactly. it out. 
Sounds like that type of shit. So yeah. it's like biological engineering. Like you change the human being. Yeah, that's fucking different. crazy, man. You can become a smarter. I know there's like a lot of evidence that like um, psychopaths, like their amygdala is kind of like malfunctioning mm -hmm. because they don't feel like emotions when they're like committing murders or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, the <laughs> so they like, for example, they can lie really well because they they know what the laws are, but they don't appreciate them. So if they have like a corpse in the fucking car, like and a cop mm. pulls them over, they're totally chill. Yeah. Because yeah. they don't have the emotional they thing, don't like, oh fear. fuck, there's a fucking body in my car. They're like, yeah, whatever, yeah. it's just a normal fucking day. So they get away with a lot of stuff. But the crazy thing about like psychopaths is <coughs> usually you're born with a failed amygdala, right? Mm -hmm. And the crazy thing is that nobody knows what the true personality of a psychopath would be if their amygdala worked. Mm -hmm. Because what they did in real life was based off of, you know, the deterministic mm -hmm. factor of, you know, their brain was a bit fucked or whatever. Yeah. You have no idea what their true personality would be if their amygdala was fine. So how the hell do you know if you can, like, um, justify their actions or, like, you know, put blame on them, put yeah, them exactly. to jail, like, whatever this kind of thing. But that's the main point. I remember I did this in, in philosophy my first year, so, like, roughly two years ago. And we did a unit on psychopaths, and me and my friends, man, we were fucking blown away in those seminars. Like, mm -hmm. our professors telling us, like, all these things, we're like, oh my god, I can't believe it. Actually, it was yeah. so crazy. I, and when I did that course, like, I really fucking wish I was studying philosophy, because I'd be blown away, like, all the time mm -hmm. by these courses, but, but the it never thing happened. <laughs> then you see the punishment, like, the reason they do the punishment is that because they want to detach this person because they're not good for society if they're in society the society doesn't hold yeah. so they just put it in prison so they're not in touch with society yeah but the important thing is it's like a coin everything you see like you understand you see you should see the other side of the coin as well like when you see the person did the wrong thing like kill someone shouldn't punish them the other point of that is over credit the person does a good thing or the person is a like a saint you shouldn't credit them as well. That's you shouldn't. A, you should because the way they doing this good thing, the way they are the saint. I I I don't say you shouldn't appraise them, but you shouldn't appraise them a lot. Like they did something extraordinary. Again, it wasn't in their decision. They was decoded to do that. Okay, they didn't have this amygdala. Mm -hmm. They had a good family. They were rich, so they could do the good thing. It's a, you shouldn't do the over credition as well. That's what I'm saying. Like, okay, over. Yeah, oh, you yeah. shouldn't over credit the person for it. But some people are proud of themselves. Oh, we, did, we did the charity. We, we did this. We did it like the founder of what is it? Bill Gates, for example. Yeah. I don't say he's a bad guy. But the way he can help other people is because of the what? capitalistic system. If it yeah. wasn't capitalistic system in the first way, he couldn't do it. If it wasn't the force of the society for donation and everything, he wouldn't do the donation. So it's over creation as well. Yeah. So this kind of view that you see both sides of the coin, it has a lot of implementation and a lot of pain. Like, then you become Swiss because everything's yeah. neutral. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's neither completely bad or completely good. <laughs> But then you see a depressed person, you see a person with schizophrenia, it's one side of this personality. The other side is that maybe the guy is genius. Because if you're not normal, you're not in the, what is a normal line, so you're above or under it, you already have a disease, or you are a genius, so it could go other way. Yeah, because a lot of like genius people are like crazy introverts, uh, crazy. Exactly. who would like work like 15 hours a day, and it depends Same, yeah. again it depends if you're lucky or not if you are exposed to the good but how, how is that possible that genetically every human being is the same and yet some people are born with being complete geniuses in certain areas uh, and then in not not in others then some are balanced no, some are not like how the fuck I is mean, that genetically, uh, they're not the same the human I mean, well, yeah, but ninety nine point nine. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, 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 no. They are the same, but 
the genetic is the same but the phenotype is not the same because you have the same gene like from your gene like genetic maybe 20 percent of it actually translate to the phenotype and the okay. way it translates is producing protein so you have the dna it uh, becomes the rna from the rna it produces the protein and the protein is an element that works in a human okay. so it does everything so from your fucking gene, yeah from the hundred percent gene it depends what genes actually turned on and what like genes, what's expressed yeah what are yeah. what you know, yeah exactly which one of them are expressed so this expression makes the differences between the individuals so surely like every human being you can have certain is it phenotype yeah the, the, like what's expressed is the phenotype yeah there's a phenotype. yeah you could like turn on or turn off certain phenotypes in people actually right but then how come like some people just haven't turned certain uh, because it comes from your parents like if your parents express some certain proteins uh, you inherited uh, that kind of gene that that certain and phenotype should express in other person that phenotype doesn't express so it's a different protein in that person and it's a combination between the gene, like this phenotype that emerged to the behavior. So, for example, there's a thousand proteins, like each one of them is responsible for certain tasks. Then there's an interaction between 1,000, maybe 999 nine, nine, nine proteins is the same between me and you, but there is one protein that differs. So the interaction, the whole thing makes a different okay. result. <laughs> You know, <laughs> this friend of mine that really good in this kind of topic, like philosophy, psychology, kind of thing, he was biologist. The biologist, if you're biology and you have this concept of biology, you can see things really better mm. regarding the psychological thing. And the, Who is this? No, nah, my friend back in Iran, like, oh, okay. he was like a dentist. And, yeah. He was a dentist? He, he got the gold medal and he then studied dentistry. Then I saw him one night in a party. <laughs> I was smoking for myself and two friends, and he came in and he was really good at dancing, so he was dancing with the girl outside. So oh, this guy is cool, maybe we should make friends with him. And they were smoking, he came in, you do have a light? And I said, yeah, why not? <laughs> <laughs> then he started smoking, then you, the way the person speaks, you can say he's cool or not, or he's yeah. talented. So I invited you want to play poker sometimes. Uh, that time I had this weekly poker thing in my home, like, we gather in my home and we play poker with friends. I said, yeah, why not? He came to my home, then I went to his home, we just, just continued. And he had a dog by that time, so okay. I was kind of <laughs> inclined to have a relationship. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. What time is it, sir? Let me check. It's, uh, Here. I don't know which side. Yeah, let's just finish it here. Yeah, let's finish it. Let's get this.